The following program is brought to you in part by the film Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace. This is July 1st, 1994, and guess what? The chairman of the PLO, Yasser Arafat, is going to visit his homeland. He was born in Gaza, and he's returning after about 28 years, I think, maybe 48 years. We're not sure. No one gets a correct count on that score. And in about uh, 45 minutes, he is uh, due to enter Gaza and have his homecoming. He will then change from being the PLO chairman to the chairman of the Palestinian Liberation Authority. And uh, he will stay in Gaza, uh, we think, for three days and thereafter travel to Jericho. It is going to be a hectic time in Israel. There is an enormous amount of opposition. Jerusalem, as you've seen this morning and you will see later, is full of demonstrators from the right wing and from people who think that uh, Mr. Rabin has gone too far. We expect to see Gaza packed with Palestinians who are welcoming uh, Mr. Arafat. He's staying in a private mansion. I think the whole Gaza has one hotel which has 24 rooms, which is jam-packed with media people. And in any case, uh, it is historic. You may not agree with it, you may agree with it, but uh, something has transpired. Israel will never be the same. Gaza has been returned to a Palestinian authority. Jericho is now part of a Palestinian authority. We are here on the scene to bring it to you live. We'll give you an eyeful and an earful as we progress. We're about 10 minutes now from uh, Gaza area and the checkpoint areas where there will be immense security to make sure that uh, no one is going to take a pop at Mr. Arafat, nor will there be any violence between the demonstrators such as uh, Hamas. People who I understand are not coming to uh, welcome Mr. Arafat. So it'll be a very interesting and historic day. What's interesting to note is why Arafat did this so quickly. I, everyone expected that Arafat would meet with uh, Prime Minister Rabin and Foreign Minister Perez next week in Paris and then coordinate his visit to Gaza. And, and a lot of people thought he would first initially go uh, to Jericho. But being a surprised character as he is, he decided to come today. No one really understands the reasoning, and uh, they'll give you all kinds of different theories, but uh, I'm sure it's something none of us know about. I spoke yesterday with Ahmed Tibi, who is his Israeli representative in, uh, in Israel, and has been under fire, by the way. The foreign ministry declared an Israeli Arab cannot be a, a mediator or go-between between the PLO and uh, Israel. But in any case, Tibi informed me that uh, he spoke with the rabbis and the chief rabbi, the Sephardic chief rabbi of Israel, asked that Arafat not come in on a Saturday because the Israeli soldiers would have to be working on the Shabbat, which is the holy day. So Arafat had agreed to come on Friday. I think it's tied into something that has to do with Mubarak, because he will be coming from Cairo to, his, uh, to Gaza, and I believe it has something to do with that. It's also interesting about the timing when he's coming. It seems to me that he's timed it so that he can get vast media attention, but uh, poor Mr. Arafat didn't think that O.J. Simpson might be involved in a murder case, so he's got a little competition going there, and uh, also I think they're a bit worried about the World Cup. Uh, soccer seems to be uh, transfixing the world, and uh, Arafat is competing against them. Uh, you will note that none of the major uh, networks have sent their star reporters like uh, Tom Brokaw or Dan Rather, Connie Chung, or Ted Koppel. Uh, they will be covered by their local resident people here, who are very good, by the way. But uh, I think Arafat would have preferred to make this a massive media event. Uh, perhaps it will be. We can't tell you how it'll play out. What we're going to show you is a lot of the atmosphere, the surroundings, because uh, by the time you do see this tape, you will have seen the actual movement of Arafat into Gaza. I'm sure you'll see it on all your networks. And we want to give you the feeling, the ambiance about what is going on in Israel, amongst the people and amongst the Arab people, how they feel. Is Arafat really their leader? 
can Arafat delegate into a democratic process so that people uh, can uh, be governed in a sense? And there's been a lot of problem about that. Another problem he has is money, big money problems. And uh, if he does not get funding, then Gaza will stay the way it is. And it's not a very nice place. It's, uh, it's uh, littered, has a lot of garbage, has bad uh, infrastructure. The uh, sewerage system doesn't work well. The medical systems don't work very well. People are very poor. So Mr. Arafat has a lot of work cut out for him. And instead of being majestic, I think he's got to roll up his sleeves and go to work. What we've done now is uh, parked our van, which we were traveling in. We're at the checkpoint now. And what we have to do, it's interesting, is transfer to an Arab vehicle. So we have our Arab uh, driver. What's his name? What's your name? Jamil. Jamil, who will now take us to uh, Aza. The last time, as you can recall, on our TV show, I visited Aza. I was in an armored uh, car with the Israeli Defense Forces, and we had a few stones and ninjas thrown at us. It seems to me that we're in for a more peaceful day, which means peace may have a dividend. We will see. We're going to cover events as they transpire. We're about 45 minutes away from the arrival of uh, Chairman Arafat. And you can see a mass of people trying to get in to witness uh, this historic occasion. We will bring you pictures and commentary as we see it. There will be obviously a enormous amount of traffic jams from people who want to get in and, and witness the state. We just uh, saw an American citizen who had a one-day visa who was not allowed to get through to Gaza. He was very disappointed that Arabs had traveled, obviously, from the United States to witness the uh, homecoming of uh, Chairman Arafat to his uh, homeland. What you're witnessing here are workers who've returned uh, from their day's work in Israel and are going back to their home at Gaza. I think the greatest commodity one could have today is a taxi cab. Everybody's looking for a ride. And probably most of them are full of press people like us who are trying to capture this uh, historic event. He go through two roadblocks now, an Israeli and a Palestinian. In order to get into Gaza, we will have to pass two roadblocks. One is an Israeli roadblock for their security reasons. And then, for the first time ever for me, I'm going to be going through a Palestinian roadblock. It has never happened to me before, and uh, this is part of the DOP that was signed September 13th on a White House lawn, where uh, we brought you Mr. Rabin and Mr. Arafat shaking hands. Palestinian checkpoint. these are Palestinian policemen. They are examining uh, well, we passed one checkpoint, and uh, luckily for our sound man, he had a Palestinian press card, something new also. We're into another Palestinian checkpoint. Hello, Hello. Hello. Arafat's picture is all over every checkpoint. You getting a picture? As you can see by uh, 
the pictures down there is not one of the world's paradises. It's a tough place that's been neglected for about 40 years. People are living in tremendous poverty, and it needs a terrific amount of infusion of money. And these pictures speak more than a thousand words. Meanwhile, today it's a celebration day. It's uh, three days before July 4th in New York City, an Independence Day. And this is a semi-independent day for the Arabs of Israel. One must take into account that today is a holy day. It's uh, Friday. The Muslims, uh, it's their Saturday. It's their Shabbat. So a lot of the stores, I assume, are closed for this purpose. Could also be that they've closed in celebration of uh, Mr. Arafat's visit to Gaza. As you can see, you don't see many 1999 and 1998 Mercedes here, and you don't see many automobiles that are uh, younger than 10 years. So uh, I guess the world has to pump some money or a lot of money into this economy to make sure that the peace holds. I believe that there are approximately a million people living in Gaza. I would suspect that if we ran this route two years ago, we would be stoned and uh, clubbed and ninja. This would not be a very safe road two years ago, is that correct? So things do have changed. The driver working with us today is an Arab man who's uh, 42 years old. He's extremely happy about the fact that um, this peace process has happened and continuing and very excited about seeing his chairman return to Gaza. Little, little. How do you feel today? I don't, uh, I don't know speak English. Little, little. I mean, Margis, very, very emotional. You feel very, very good. You're now very, on American very television. Very, very good. You're a Palestinian policeman? Yes. Yes. What's your name? Adnan Elbaz. Thank you. How many people you expect here today to visit? To greet the chairman, how many people you expect? Uh, you expect uh, about 1,500 people. Uh, people. Uh, people. Yes, uh, Everybody is happy that the, uh, he calls him the Rosh Hashem Shalah, which is the Prime Minister. He's actually the chairman of the Palestinian uh, Liberation Administration. Everybody seems happy. What did you do before you were a policeman? Ask him what he did before he was a policeman. I saw a bit the boil to the team the Israel. He worked in a construction. He worked as a construction man. You go you part of be a policeman? I'm gonna tell him to do it rather than uh get him uh fish with the police. Good luck. Good luck. Good luck. In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time, the 1978 Camp David Accord. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace, learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time and its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high to have this courageous man and my close friend killed. Winner of the Telly Award for Best Cultural Program. Now available at select stores including Barnes & Noble and online at Amazon.com. Get the book that inspired the award-winning movie, Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels. Learn about the backdoor channel negotiations that led to the historic 1978 Israeli-Egyptian peace treaty. Become a witness to history and order backdoor channels online at Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Also available at all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at iTunes or Audible.com. Relive history. Order backdoor channels. Get back.
best-selling author Leon Charney's latest book, The Battle of the Two Talmuds. Join Charney as he explores years of Jewish history to find out why and how Talmudic scholars and rabbis abandoned the Holy Land for the lands of the diaspora. Learn about the power struggles behind the creation of the Jerusalem and Babylonian Talmuds. It's a book critics call engaging and enlightening, a book which will be of interest to people of every faith. Now available at Amazon and Barnes & Noble, or download the audiobook of The Battle of the Two Talmuds at iTunes or Audible.com. Leon Charney sets out to discover the true meaning of the Kaddish, the Jewish custom of reciting a prayer to commemorate the death of a close relative. Join Charney as he finds out the history of the Kaddish and how it has evolved. Reviewed as a refreshing walk through Jewish history and a book that deserves to be read by both Jews and non-Jews, The Mystery of the Kaddish is now available online at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at audible.com or on iTunes. Discover The Mystery of the Kaddish. I hope that it goes peacefully, that there's no uh, 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 action taken by either side which results in any harm to anyone, and I hope that it, that it becomes a, uh, an event which does the, the peace process proud on both sides, um, both for the Arabs and for the Jews live in the, who now look like they're going to have to share this land in some sort of agreement, um, and it looks like Come the following month or so, Mr. Arafat's going to be moving to uh, Gaza or Jericho, and uh, this is going to be his home. Yasser yes, Arafat coming to Gaza right now makes a lot of mess in the country. He's uh, holding people uh, at attention to his demands, and he doesn't show any receipts on them outside that he is really wants peace. He wants to show up to make personal gain immediately. I think finally the Pal Palestinians in Gaza will understand that. Eventually, the peace has come, and uh, they will understand that it wasn't for nothing. I think he's a terrorist. I think he's a murderer. He deserves to die. I don't care where he dies. I don't care where he goes. I feel it's a day of national shame for Israel, and uh, it will lead very soon to war. For me, it means nothing. They are uh, driven by a feeling that they are sensing some sense of freedom. And I think, uh, as we all know, freedom is a precious, precious uh, feeling. It looks like I was on the lawn uh, September 13th when the DOP, the Declaration of Principle, was signed. And this is some kind of fulfillment of that Declaration of Principle. So, Mr. Clinton, you can take a handshake for this, and Mr. Perez and Mr. Robin. And uh, we will show the sentiments of the Israelis and the Jewish population later. Meanwhile, I must be a very popular guy because I gather crowds. There's nobody like me, I'm telling you. Jackie Mason were here, he could do terrible because he doesn't, they don't understand him. But me, they understand. Everybody's around me looking happy. There you are. It's the Leon Charney Report. You're home in New York, and I'm in the middle of Schwitz, which is sweating in Gaza, to bring you the authentic feeling of what it's like to be here on Israeli uh, Dependence Day in, and uh, Palestinian Independence Day, not Israeli. I guess in a way it's an independence for Israel also because I think many in Israel are happy to give Gaza back to the Arab people. My suspicions are that 70-80% of the people here are happy about it. We understand that the Hamas group has not joined in the celebration. I think that might be worked out. They'll probably join in. It's somewhat, it'll be like Israeli coalitions day after day. But people are excited and uh, they want the world to know. Yasser is a master, master of uh, public relations, and he's captured the world. Uh, if you look around and you see these faces, you see some kind of hope. I will suspect that most of these kids were throwing stones six months ago. Many of them might have been even in jail. And today we have a new environment and a new possibility. So it's very, very hopeful. I think uh, you have to ask them, because uh, uh, I have been outside uh, of Gaza for 32 years ago. I live in Sweden, uh -oh. but I, I, I translate it uh, for you if you want. All right, ask them how they feel now as compared to a year ago. How do you feel now as compared to a year ago? احلى شهور مش قادرين نوصف هذا الشعور شعور كتير كتير كويس انه بدأت لنا دولة وعظمتها القدس بيتنا رئيس ويجي عنا رئيسنا ياسر عرفات They feel very 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 good uh, they, uh, uh, they want to see the, uh, their leader Mr. Arafat? Yeah Mr. Arafat are roaming all around. There are cars flying down the road here. 
Mike Bagri, Arafat, no one really knows which way he's coming. There'll be decoys for his protection, obviously. We try to visit the beach right now, and so pictures of it weren't allowed. The security is very, very tight. You get the feel of what's going on here. Cars are going down to meet the, the chairman. We saw a bunch of helicopters before. He's supposedly on his way from Cairo, Rafa, Rafia to uh, Gaza. that our butt is bringing. Mr. Arafat in an open car coming to see his people of Gaza, waving to everybody, tremendous commotion, tremendous excitement. It looked like an American president in an open vehicle. And I think that was demonstrative to show that he's not fearful. In an open, unbubbled vehicle, he walked in. Something new and dramatic for Arafat. In Israel, and Israel is a Jewish state and belongs to the Jews. We're talking about a person who's declared, I'm going to Jerusalem to conquer Jerusalem. We're supposed to sit by calmly and allow him to come in as a conqueror of Jerusalem. He didn't come for peace, he came for, for a peace, a peace of this, a peace of that. Wasn't jammed in a schoolyard, he said the goal is a Palestinian state with the capital in Jerusalem. We have signed with the Israeli people, through their uh, prime minister, on a peace with the, on a peace agreement of the braves. Now, a peace, peace of the brave. Much more need to be done for this peace, on which I signed with Mr. Rabin. He is repeating his vows to the martyrs. He is returning his vows. The ambulance keep on disturbing us with the sirens as if nothing is happening. We have much work to do. The main message has been given and it will not be repeated. Uh, they said he is walking on a tight rope and uh, as I said, the problem is the lack of a real message. I'd like to show you what I've been mentioning, that is, the movement of the crowd outside the square while Arafat is still delivering the first part of his speech. People are simply leaving the place. He is mentioning all the countries which hosted Palestinian forces during the diaspora years.
Now he's sig signaling to Saudi Arabia by thanking it for arranging the flight of the Palestinian police forces to Egypt from, the, from there to uh, Gaza and Jericho. It is a refreshing, uh, reconciling call towards Saudi Arabia. He offers his kisses to the children of the Intifada. You can see the uh, tremendous difficulty in covering this uh, rather disorderly event to use the moderate language in this matter. Jack, he said, we will build Palestine together. is visiting his hometown of Gaza. The people keep coming and coming. You hear shots. They are shots of happiness. These are not bullets to kill. The noise is tremendous. Evidently, they don't know how to celebrate, so they use any mechanism they can. But we've brought you the live pictures, and now we're going to Jerusalem to find out what the Israelis think of this whole incident and this whole arrival. And wouldn't like to share uh, Jerusalem with Arabs. But right-wingers in Jerusalem tonight chant the biggest demonstrations ever seen here. And protesters say, to kill the peace deal with the PLO, they'll shut down Israel's government. They are exaggerating uh, the, the whole picture. He, they know that uh, what they are saying is not accurate. People hold such bad memories of him that it's going to be very hard to forgive and forget. After uh, 50 years of suffering, we like the Palestinian people to live well, grow well, and to be educated, and that's all we're looking for. In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time, the 1978 Camp David Accord. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace, learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time and its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high. To have this courageous man and my close friend killed. Winner of the Telly Award for Best Cultural Program. Now available at select stores including Barnes & Noble and online at Amazon.com. Get the book that inspired the award-winning movie, Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels. Learn about the Backdoor Channel negotiations that led to the historic 1978 Israeli-Egyptian peace treaty. Become a witness to history and order Backdoor Channels online at Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Also available at all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at iTunes or Audible.com. Relive history. Order Backdoor Channels. Charney sets out to discover the true meaning of the Kaddish, the Jewish custom of reciting a prayer to commemorate the death of a close relative. Join Charney as he finds out the history of the Kaddish and how it has evolved. Reviewed as a refreshing walk through Jewish history and a book that deserves to be read by both Jews and non-Jews, The Mystery of the Kaddish is now available online at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at audible.com or on iTunes. Discover The Mystery of the Kaddish. We have just returned from Gaza, but we've seen uh, Yasser Arafat triumphantly return to his uh, birthplace. We come to Jerusalem now and we see these massive demonstrations against what the Israeli government has done. You're from New York and you live in Israel now. I was born in New York and I, I, mean, I live in Israel already more than 20 years and I'm so shocked by what is going on now in my country how something like such a murderer can be accepted here instead of bringing him into jail and putting him on trial like any other murderer, like any other terrorist, after all the people, after all the Jews that he has killed. And instead of that, we're, we're welcoming him. We're together with the Palestinians. We're, we're organizing a welcome committee. I, it's so shocking. I can't believe it. Did you see him today come to Gaza? Did you watch it? 
I saw for a few minutes on television. It was enough, but I saw him. No, no, I can't believe it's really happening. I'm not interested in watching it more. I know it's happening, and that's why I'm here now. I don't live here in Yerushalayim. I live with, I left elsewhere, and I came here with my family, with my children, to protest for as long as we need to try to get all the people together with us, because I know that the majority of the people together with me object to what's going on now. And I think that the, that Rabin, that the Prime Minister is taking advantage of the fact that he has a minority in the government, but that he's able to put it through, and he's doing things against the will of the majority of the people here. What are you trying to achieve here with these demonstrations? We're trying to show that how massive these demonstrations will become more and more massive because to show that the majority of the people really do object to what's going on now, do not agree to what Rabin is doing, and that we will do all that we can to show him and to pressure him and to force him to stop it and do what the people want. We, we, in a democracy, the people are supposed to decide. But in a democracy, hasn't he been elected? Right, but right now he has a... His uh, government is a minority. It's 56 with five Arabs. Right, exactly. So certainly it's a minority of Jews. And since this is, I think, it's still a Jewish country, at least meanwhile, and it's supposed to be a Jewish country, I don't see how morally, even if technically he can pass what he wants in the parliament, in the Knesset, morally I think it is immoral to take, to use a minority to pass, to, to force the, minor, the majority to accept it. Chaya, what would your policy be? What would you do with the Palestinians? What would I do with the Palestinians? If they want to live here and accept the fact that they live as a minority in a Jewish country, they're welcome. They, just like any other minority lives in a, in a different country, they can be here with full rights. I, t I think it's terrible that they don't have civil rights here. I think they should be accepted as citizens in a Jewish country. This is a Jewish country. It's, the co it's our country. And they can live here, but that's all. But it's our country. And if they want to be a majority, they have Jordan. In Jordan, they are a majority. They don't need another country. This is ours, and that's fair. Do you fair. think the Likud or the right-wing parties have been very effective in bringing about uh, your points of view? Not, not effective enough. I don't think they're strong enough. They don't organize their people in a strong enough manner to, to really try to pull down the, the government. I think they're able to because we have the masses, but I don't think they're organized enough yet and they're not effective yet. Right, you're gonna, you're, it's Friday night now. You intend to spend the weekend here with your family? That's right. And you expect to be joined by thousands of other people? I assume that on Saturday night, many, many more thousands are going to come. There are going to be thousands of buses coming. And that will be the real mass demonstration. That will be in the center of the city. And we'll continue on through Sunday to, to show that the masses are against what is happening. But always peaceful. I certainly hope so. But I've, I personally have already seen and felt what police brutality is. When I was sitting peacefully on, uh, in a sit-in on a street, and I, was, and I know what uh, police brutality is, and I certainly hope that uh, they're not going to start again. We don't intend to provoke any, any violence. Well, good luck. Am I allowed to shake your hand? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank we'll you. We'll be back after commercial break to wrap up a day in the life of Israel, Gaza, Jerusalem. I don't know what else is left, but uh, we'll find it for you. Maybe you can explain a few means that we are using here in order to try to prevent stones and things like this to hurt the soldiers. This is what you see here is Perspex. It's uh, simply in order to prevent the stones from getting in. And as you can see, we put it on the roof too, as we had problems that uh, children, and not only children, grown-ups, used to throw big stones, I mean stones this big, on the roofs. And we had a few soldiers that were badly injured some of them will never walk again. At least two soldiers will never walk again. So this is the reason for the perspex on the roofs. These are our means in order to protect the roof. Okay. You want to see? What we have to understand is that all those means are in order to protect our soldiers and some of the things that those people are throwing can kill. For instance, a day ago, we were doing some work in the camp and they throw in a Jeep a refrigerator, a whole refrigerator, 
and it went through the, all the protection and went into the jeep and only by a miracle nobody was killed. I mean, they are throwing everything. And when and they are throwing stones and rocks and metal and things like this and stones, I mean big stones, all those things. And what we are doing with all these means are just trying not to come to a situation that we have to kill people. We are doing everything and this is the only reason for the rubber and the plastic and the gas and all the other things. The only reason is not to kill people. The easiest thing for us to do is when somebody, for a four-year-old kid, throws a stone to aim a bullet and to kill him. That's the easiest thing. And we, all the other means are only to prevent this. This is very important to understand. This is the one, our army is one of the most humanitarian army in the world. I never saw in any other state in the world an army that makes so, uh, such an effort and gives so much money just not to kill people. And you can compare it to China. We have here from the beginning of the Intifada, two years, about 500 people that were killed. And they had it in the 5,000 in one day. So everybody can make this comparison and see what we are dealing here with. Very important. I come here to Miluim. Uh, we do with this, uh, I'm do with these soldiers uh, patrol in Gaza. Uh, keep uh, the main road uh, empty from uh, tires and uh, block that we could, the army and the Arabs that want to go and to continue their uh, life could go in the road and the, the road will be open. Uh, this is our main uh, business here, or for, 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 for us, to do the, uh, our patrol is to do this. Uh, of course, doing we do this, sometimes uh, stones and uh, battles uh, with gasoline is swirling us. So we have to try to catch the people and do it. It's dangerous, very dangerous, because I know that some of my friends, uh, today she sit on uh, Kisei Galgalim. Witcher. It's a witcher. Yeah, one uh, stone come to her neck, and today she can't go with her legs. We're very scared. And we have... I can't do nothing because we have the <laughs> the, name the officer told us what to do. I can't to, to do what I think to do. If somebody is <laughs> strong, to me, I need to wait to to think, to, to do what, to ask him what to do, if to, to work with the gun or not. What do you do when it's so strong? I'm here, I'm What do you do? I run after him and I, I need to catch him. But he can throw a stone at you. So I can't do nothing. I think that people in Khutzlaret, uh, abroad, abroad, don't feeling what we feeling. They're not seeing nothing that's not feeling the strong. Them only seeing the TV on to listen from the newspaper, yeah? Only the soldiers that work in the Raza and all the situation, only them know what, what's, the, yeah, what's going on. Yeah. What's your wish? Peace. Only peace. In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time, the 1978 Camp David Accord. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace, learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time and its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high to have this courageous man and my close friend killed. Winner of the Telly Award for Best Cultural Program. Now available at select stores including Barnes & Noble and online at Amazon.com. Get the book that inspired the award-winning movie, Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels. Learn about the Backdoor Channel negotiations that led to the historic 1978 Israeli-Egyptian peace treaty. Become a witness to history and order Backdoor Channels online at Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Also available at all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at iTunes or Audible.com. Relive history. Order Backdoor Channels.
I just want to to go out the piece here. And uh, when I walk in the in the alley and at night, and there is a uh, dar darkness around, and I and I uh, take a look at the at the at the top of me, and I see a black uh, stone falling just near me, nearby. I'm just uh, my heart starts to beat very fast, and I'm feeling just uh, I'm asking myself what I'm doing here. Well, as you see, I'm a soldier here. I can't do nothing here. There is, uh, there is the issue here of the policy. And I can't uh, tell the people that uh, that uh, tell me what to do. I can't tell them uh, that I, want, I don't want to be here. The small children, about uh, 10 till 15 years old, are throwing me stones. I have a brother at home that is uh, in that same age. And when I see that child uh, with uh, handcuffs on his hand, I, uh, it's, it's doing to me something uh, inside. It's not, uh, it's doing me something. It's very bad, the feeling is bad. But uh, that is the job here. I, uh, personally, I, uh, I can't say I like it. This is a thing we have to do. This is a, a not very pleasant job, but we have to do it. These close encounters with the civilians make us... Uh, this is not a thing we are uh, trained or uh, made to do. An army is made to fight, not to mix with uh, civilians and uh, deal with children. But uh, this is what we have to do. This is the mission uh, gave to us. And uh, although I don't like it, I do, I do it. Would you say it's a war here? In, uh, in one aspect it is a war, because there are two sides, and uh, each side wants uh, an opposite, uh, has opposite interests, and uh, both sides use violence, so you can call it a war. But this is not, certainly not a conventional war, because one side is a, is a regular army with all its gear and all its power, and the other side are civilians, which uh, has other means and other methods of fighting. But uh, although you can uh, say they are primitive, but they can sure cause uh, great damage to us, even though we are an army and they have weapons and all, you see that uh, even simple methods and simple uh, means can, great, can make great damage to us. Which side uses more violence? You can't determine which side uh, uses more violence, because uh, our violence is mostly a reaction to their violence. We don't go around and shoot uh, everyone we see or uh, things like that. We use violence only in reaction to, to violence opposed by them. This, they put it on roads and they make an ambush for every for vehicle that uh, on the road. They stop, they, of course they would like that the vehicle will stop and then they attack the vehicle, they attack the people, the soldier or civilian who is in the, in the vehicle. With this, they put it in, in the road, and then a vehicle arrive, driving on uh, night time, and then he get flat on the tires, of course, because of this, and stop. And in the moment that the vehicle stop, they attack the vehicle with the stones, with the molotovs, and uh, break the windows, and try to get hurt the soldiers which were inside the, the vehicle. This, uh, for example, this kind of, uh, of a big, big knife, butcher knife, maybe may, may we call it. This also, they are using it to attack soldiers who are making patrol in the, in the roads, or uh, mainly when they are walking in the roads. How, how, how would they do that? To, to run to the soldiers and to try to attack the soldiers, and sometimes to hide behind a wall or something like this, and the last soldier on the patrol they would try to attack him from the back with this kind of, uh, of weapon. Like Now we see also another uh, weapon, you can see, think, think like that. This is very heavy, of course, and very sharp. And uh, if somebody gets hurt from uh, this kind of weapon, there is no doubt that he will be killed. Also we can see uh, here, this is, a, this is an example of uh, Molotov's of Molotov that they use. They take liquid, gasoline, or something like this. It's very easy to prepare it. 
You don't need any factory to manufacture uh, this kind of weapon. They, they take a piece of this and put it, and uh, then they burn it, and when the vehicle, our vehicle, uh, drove on the road, they throw it to the vehicle, and then this is break to pieces, and all the liquid inside spread all over the vehicle and burn the vehicle. Unfortunately, we have a few soldiers who get injured very, very serious, very severe from uh, this kind of uh, Molotov battle that, uh, that they use. This is, very, this is a regular uh, water pipe. They take the water pipe, shut it from both sides, put inside uh, dynamite, and then they, uh, they throw it, and then when this, when this explodes, the dangerous is not from the dynamite inside, but from the, all the pieces of the metal that are thrown uh, away from it and uh, can hurt very, very serious. We are living here in a region that around us, unfortunately, still few countries except Egypt that we have a peace with Egypt uh, since the last uh, 10 years. There is another country who uh, are threatening our existence here and uh, the main uh, the main mission of the IDF is to protect the Israeli state and not to attack someone else, but to protect the Israeli state. If there is need, if there is need to to protect yourself, and uh, you must also attack somebody for it, so uh, the IDF also able to do it. Have you been interviewed by by uh, by the television, foreign no. television? No, no. never. Oh. On television. Did they ask any questions that I asked you? No. They are usually when the foreign uh, television come to here, they are uh, circling on the streets. Then even even if uh, if the the same uh, day it's quiet on the street, but all the time there is a kind of event that happened here and there when somebody throws stone, and then they uh, picture this scene that may may maybe sometimes it take only for 20 or 30 minutes all the event. And uh, then what you see uh, on the news, this at least what we see in our television, what's showing, the foreigner television, what's showing on road uh, outside. They don't come, they, don't, they didn't come to ask questions, to really to understand, uh, or to understand also our side, or to understand the real events, how they happened, what happened, what's behind it, and uh, et cetera. Mashimcha? Morris. Morris. He's bleeding now. He was just hit by a stone, I guess, who on his way to interview the military commander. And lucky for him that it was a bulletproof window, otherwise he might be in a hospital now. What he's saying basically is that he's used to it, that uh, there's free press to go to visit all these areas, that Israel is a democratic country and he brings the people back and forth. It's not the first time that he's been hit by a stone or a rock or something. He's not obviously happy about it, but it's Rogil. It's, uh, he's used to it. I, in my opinion, looks a little bit shell-shocked, but uh, that's my opinion. Uh, coincidentally, we were supposed to be on that van and uh, we, missed the, we missed the boat and we took another. A uh, jeep, and uh, thankfully that was not hit. Otherwise, Morris would have been my driver, and I'd be in his jam. But I'm happy that a tabaria shav came. He's healthy. He's a good man. He feels healthy, and he knows this is what life is about. When you're driving uh, uh, press people to uh, the Gaza Strip and to the settlements. What brings you here today? What brings me to, to announce all the world, Jerusalem, Jerusalem is only for Jews you... and not for Arafat and you will not allow him to come in alive. Do you believe your government will allow uh, Arafat to come? It's to not Jerusalem? my government. The most of the nation of the people are against that government. But it's still the duly elected democratic government. And I know you're a very educated man, and you know exactly what a law is and what a, a, a not a law is. It was not a democrat because more than 100,000 people 
was for the right. But because of the, uh, of the law of uh, Hasima, how do you call it in English? Blockade. Blockade. We, we lose more than 100,000 voters. So it's not Democrat, it occurred so, but it, it's not the majority. The majority is with us. And you can see it around all the people. Mr. Gandhi, a member of Knesset, said that he hopes... He's not only a member, he's my chairman, chairman of Molede. I am a, 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 a member of the parliament from Molede party, and Gandhi is the chairman. He said now on uh, television he would love to see Arafat dead. You feel the same? Sure, Arafat will be dead. It's only a question of time, and it's uh, in the Torah. Vayachbed Hashem et lev paro. So it, uh, we read it. Paro is the same words of Arafat. In Hebrew, pei reish ayin is like a ayin reish pei. Vayachbed Hashem is only a meaning of time, and we will win it at last. What is your opinion of uh, Rabin and Perez? Why do you think they move this way? They are tired. Not, not only tired, they have not, they have not uh, emuna, faith, belief, faith, faith. Belief, faith. faith. They have not believed in the in, in Israel, in the nation, the old nation in the world. And we know that nation that still alive more than three thousand years from the Sinai, uh, when we received the the Bible, the Torah. We know that Israel will remain to all in all state of Israel. And then we came to Jerusalem to see the people who are camping out vociferously uh, showing their uh, feelings and opinions about how wrong the Rabin government is, that Arafat is a murderer. And we had a member of Knesset, Mr. Gandhi of the Maleta party, said he wishes Arafat death. Seconded by Rabbi Bagas, I believe his name is, from Rachalayim, who wishes him also death and brings in Paro. Uh, one thing for sure, it'd be tough to be Yitzhak Robin tonight and sleep well. We'll see you next week. What's your wish? Peace. peace. Only peace. peace.